let me ask you a question. If you knew that this was your last day on earth today, what would you say to folks around you, your friends, your family, to your neighbors? What would you say to them? Would you say something that was funny? Or would you say something maybe serious? Would you try to impart to them just jokes of the day? Or would you really try to impart to them something that was really heavy upon your heart? I think we all know what we would try to do. We would probably try to tell those around us that we love them. Uh, we want the best for them. We have you know, aspirations for them. Hopefully we try to impart wisdom and direction to them before we leave. Since we're not going to be around anymore, we want to hopefully tell them as much as we can tell them before we're gone. And I believe the same principle applies when we look at the life of Christ. Everything he said in his life was important and we follow them. But do you kind of put a little bit more emphasis on his very last words? As a person, as a believer, and even as a person, if you're going to leave your last words probably have a little bit more weight at that particular time. And you want whatever you say to really affect the people you're saying it to because that's your last time. What were Jesus' last words? In Matthew, it says, 28 verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And then near the end of Mark, he says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. And finally, in Acts, just before he ascends for the last time, in verse 8, he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what happens after he says that? Gone. Verse 9 says, after he said that, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. The very last thing that he told his disciples and basically telling us, share the gospel. Share the gospel. I've mentioned before, there are a lot of things that we do here as believers, but a lot of the things that we do, we can also do when we're in heaven. You can pray in heaven. You can worship in heaven. You can have fellowship with God in heaven. What's the one thing you can't do when you're in heaven? Tell other people about heaven. That's our great commission, the Bible calls it. If this was Jesus' very last words, do you think that they could be maybe important to us? We would probably try to impart lessons to people that we are leaving, lessons that we've learned in our life to hopefully help them from making the same mistakes that we have. And parents, we all do that, correct? Try to tell them, things that we've done so that they don't do them, to avoid the struggles and the troubles and the problems that we had. We want them to be prepared for their future because we're not going to be here. Jesus gave his last words. He was doing the very same thing. He was telling them to prepare for their future and prepare for the future of those they're going to come in contact with. And sometimes I think maybe even as American Christians, we have a tendency to look around at, at society today And we all know that Jesus is coming back. We all know there's going to be a rapture. But we kind of, maybe it's not in the front of our mind. And it's been so long, it's maybe going to be, you know, somewhere down the road. And we don't live our lives with the knowledge that it could possibly be today. When we walk out the door, it could be the last time we get together as a church. Christ could come back today. And we forget about what happens when we're gone. Now, we've been doing a study in Revelation on Wednesday night. And in Revelation, you know, a confusing book, a mysterious book, and it's good to study it. We don't want to stay there because we're not going to, Christians won't going to be here during most of Revelation. But it's good to understand what is going to happen during that time. And the reason it's good for us to understand is not because we're going to endure it, but to understand that others that we know will. Revelation 6.2 It says, I looked and there before me was a white horse, a rider held a bow, and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. These are just a few scriptures of what's going to happen once we're gone as believers. And the people we know, maybe our family members, maybe our friends, maybe people we live with who don't know Christ, 
These are things that they are going to experience. Revelation 6, 4. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. Verse 8. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. Chapter 8, verse 5, the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And the last one I'm just going to read, Revelation 9, verse 3 to 6, out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were given not power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. That is what is in the future, and it could be the near future of this earth. I came across, there's a, a new movie coming out, and I came across a video, I watched the, the trailer for the movie. And as I watched the trailer, now it's about an alien invasion, but I watched the trailer and I, I had Brad edit a, a little bit of it, it's only about 30 seconds. But this is kind of an example of what's going to happen. As I watched the trailer, I thought, oh, they, they could be talking about Revelation in these things. So if you want to go ahead and hit that, it's only about 30 seconds. The first wave knocked out all the power. Then the second wave hit. An earthquake strong enough to shake the entire planet. Cassie! Okay, I got you. With the third wave, disease spread across the world. By the fourth wave, they were among us. The others have the ability to inhabit human hosts. They could be anywhere. We can't trust anyone anymore. If you are here during the tribulation time and you have not heard the gospel but you get saved during that time, that's what's going to be in store for you. They are going to hunt you down and martyr you. Now we've been praying, we had this week of prayer, we've been praying throughout this week for our church to be effective in what we do, to be able to communicate the love of Christ to the neighbors, our friends, our family, and we want the Holy Spirit to obviously anoint us to do that because we can't save anyone. But we pray that God is able to use us to minister to someone else. Why? Because we don't want those we know going through that. Jesus' last words was to preach the gospel. And that directive has not changed. Now we study Revelation and if you, I'm not a big Revelation guy. I don't follow the guys that are on TV and it's, it's okay to follow them because we all get jazzed up about you know, all that kind of stuff. But we don't stay there. We use it as information. We use it as a catalyst to get us concerned about what's going to happen to those that are left behind. As bad as the tribulation will be, and we're going to get to what I'm going to talk about today. As bad as that is going to be, it's only three and a half to seven years. Maybe friends and family, if they have not heard the gospel, get saved during that time. And the worst they'll suffer is martyrdom. The worst they'll suffer is for seven years. And that's, that's horrific. Seven years of that kind of torture. But... It's only seven years. What do you think I'm going with this? Once you die, if you are an unbeliever, where do you go? To hell. What is the biblical view of hell? Now, there's a lot of things that are out there, a lot of folks that are teaching that there isn't one. Uh, A lot of folks think that there is one, but no one goes there. What does the Bible say about hell? There's several words that the Bible uses to describe hell. They are the word hell, Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, Tartarus. They've all been translated hell in various versions. The word Hades, which is a New Testament version, the Greek word, 
is the same as the Old Testament word Sheol. And that means the place of departed souls or world of the dead. Not the ground in which they're buried, but it's a place where their souls go after they die. It's used four times in the New Testament and it's only used by Jesus. The next word is Tartarus and it's used in 2 Peter 2.4. It says, For God did not spare even the angels when they sinned. He threw them into hell. And that means to incarcerate in eternal torment the deepest abyss in Hades. It's not Sheol, it's not Hades or hell. It's sometimes they call it the pit of darkness or the pit, the bottomless pit. And that place is only specifically made for fallen angels. It's not made for people. In fact, we'll find out later on that hell wasn't even made for people. We choose to go there. Gehenna is used by Jesus 10 times and it's used as a place or a state of eternal punishment. Mark 9, 47 says, it's better to enter the kingdom of God half blind than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. Luke 12, 4 says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after killing the body has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Revelation describes it as a place of eternal burning. Luke 16 is probably the best example we have of of hell is Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus, or Luke 16, 24, the rich man after Lazarus died and they both died to go to hell, or one goes to heaven and the other one goes to hell. Luke 16, 24, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in anguish in these flames. Matthew 25, 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. Matthew 13. Just as the weeds are separated and burned, so it will be at the end of the world. I, the son of man, will send my angels and they will remove from my kingdom Anyone or anything that causes sin in all who do evil and they will be thrown into the lake of fire in, into the furnace and burn them. Revelation 14.10 And they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and they will have no relief day or night. Hell is such a horrific place that sometimes we just can't, we can't get our hands around it. I've, you know, there, there's part of me that wishes it weren't true. Please, Lord, don't let this be true. Because I know people that are, some of my family, and I'm sure you all have the same situation. People that you love and care for, people that you may live with or work with, and you know they're not believers. They're probably good people, but they don't believe in Christ. And you're just really wishing that this place didn't exist. And maybe I misunderstood it. Maybe God's word doesn't really say that. But it's very plain that this place is an actual place. It actually exists and people are going to go there. You ever burn yourself? Touch an iron? Touch something that's hot? I remember I used to have an old Volkswagen. And if you remember the old Volkswagen, it had the two tailpipes coming out of the bottom of it. I remember I was getting up from it and I grabbed the tailpipe to get up and I burnt my second and third degree burns on my, on my hand. Worst pain I ever experienced. And it lasted about two weeks. But it was, can you imagine that? All the time, everywhere, never ending. You ever have a sunburn? That's me. Every time the sun goes out, this pale guy gets red as a beet. I use sunblock 50 because it's just not worth it. But I have been burnt several times. And it, sometimes it makes me physically sick. It just is horrible having this sunburn everywhere. And that's just a sunburn. Can you imagine being on fire? On fire. Now think about the fact that the person in hell is going to experience this on their body forever. Always. The worst part is It never ends. The seven years is going to end. This life that we have now, it may be painful now. We may not appreciate this life, but this life is going to end. Hell never ends. 
10,000 years times 10,000 years, your body will be on fire with no end in sight. Revelation described it also as a place of total darkness. A lot of people think, how many have said this? I've said this before, B.C., before I was a Christian. I'm going to find my buddies and we're going to party in hell. We're all going to hang out in hell together. Well, the Bible says that hell is a place of total darkness. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Now, that's unusual because with fire, usually there's, there's light. But in hell, there's going to be heat and fire, but no light. Total darkness. And the truth is, you'll be in so much pain, you won't be able to do anything with anybody. Matthew twenty five thirty says, Now throw this servant into utter darkness. Revelation also describes it as a place of separation. Or Matthew does. Hell was designed first and only for the fallen angels. Matthew 25, 41. We read it before. It says, eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Never designed for man. It was a place designed to keep people away from God. The fallen angels wanted to be away from God, so God separated them. That's who it was designed for. When we make a choice on this side to not serve God, God is going to keep that choice for you. If we walk around this earth and we say, you know, I'm not going to serve God, or I'm not going to serve God the way he asked me to serve him, I'm not going to believe in Jesus. I believe in God, but I'm not going to believe in Jesus. You're basically saying to God, I don't want you in my life. And God is saying, after you die, okay. You're going to a place where I am not. And hell is basically the absence of God. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me. You're no longer in God's presence. Now here, on this earth, we still have the blessing of God here. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. God provides food for us. God provides heat. God provides everything we have. God provides for us. So we have, whether you're a believer or not, you have some of the blessings of God in your life. Especially if you live in America, you have all kinds of blessings that God's given this country. And we we heard a speaker yesterday that said that this country is in a terrible mess. How many agree? But he also said the only hope for that, and which is true, and I have to remember this, it's not politics. The only hope for this country is Christians, Christ. That's the only hope because we can't change, obviously, anyone. We have no effect on whatever is being made. Decisions are being made. Choices being made. But God can change anyone. We as believers are the only hope. The church is the only hope for this country and for this world. And for us to be effective, that means we have to be different from the world. If we're just like them, then we have nothing to offer. But if they're able to see in us a difference, they may not be able to describe it, but they know that we're different. And we all, you know, the Bible says we're a peculiar people. That's King James. Some of us are more peculiar than others. But we need to be different from them. They may not be able to describe it or understand it, but I'm telling you, once they know you're a believer, once things start happening in their life, they're going to come to you. And you're going to have the answer for them. Next thing is, hell is eternal. Matthew 25, 46, and these will go into everlasting punishment. No parole, no end. It's forever. And I can't even comprehend that. Can you? I can, I can maybe comprehend never having an end. But when you talk about God, the Bible says God has no beginning. That really blows my mind. Think about that. That, there, that God never had a beginning. And if that's true, and we know that hell is true, hell never has an end. So no matter how long we think is long, it never, ever ends ever ends 
Now, I mentioned before that God doesn't send people to hell. It's we who choose it. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord isn't slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish, so he's giving more time for everyone to repent. You wonder why God's not coming back yet? It's because there's people who need to be saved yet. Now, that doesn't mean he's not going to come back tomorrow or today. But every moment that he's not returning is because other people need to hear the gospel. And other people need to be saved. And how does that happen? All of us. When you choose to reject God here, God's allowing you to make that choice. How many many have ever heard the term free will? If you don't think we have free will, look at your kids. They choose to do what they choose to do. Especially little kids. And the time you say don't step over that line is when they look at you. And they look at you and you say don't do it and they do that. And they get closer and I'm not stepping over the line. We have the ability to choose good, which means we also have the ability to choose evil. I read, a, there's a good book out, a good series, uh, The Case for Faith. It's uh, Lee, Lee Strobel. He wrote a series of case of books. And the case for faith is what, he's an attorney by trade. And what he did is he went out And he would ask other people to give attorney-like evidences for faith. You know, if you have enough evidence presented before you, can you make a logical decision? And the one question was, if, if there's a God, why is there evil? Why is there wicked things in the world? If there's God, why is there bad things? And his point was, if we have free will, if we have the ability to choose, we have to have the ability to choose wrong. If we can't choose to do bad things, then we really don't have free will. We're puppets. God's making us choose the right way. So in other words, everyone has the freedom to say no. Everyone has the ability to do good things or bad things. Everyone has the ability to say no to God's drawing in their life. That's why there's evil. And so when you make that choice here, God allows you to keep that choice after you die. And a lot of people assume that because things are going well for me here and I'm not a believer, I don't believe any of this Jesus stuff, but my life is pretty good. They assume that's going to continue after they die. Or they think there's nothing after you die. Hell is a total absence of God. Now we do a candlelight service here at Christmas and we've mentioned before that there is no such thing as darkness. Darkness is simply the absence of light. You can't go and turn the darkness up. You can turn the light down, but you can't turn darkness up. You can't bring more darkness in. Darkness is the absence of light. Hell is the total absence of God. When God is not there and everything that God has an effect on is gone is when you have totally unleashed hell, punishment, torment. That's the absence of God. And one... And besides the pain, I think one of the worst parts of hell is you're going to remember. You're going to have memory in hell. Back to our verse in Luke 16, Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus goes to heaven, rich man goes to hell. And he says, it's son. In verse 25 he says, but Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he's being comforted and you are in anguish. Remember everything that I did for you here and you still chose to ignore me. Remember every time you heard someone tell you about Jesus. Remember every sermon you ever heard. Remember your family telling you about it. Remember your friends telling you about it. Remember everything you had here. Every opportunity you missed, you're gonna remember that. All the choices you made that you could have made a different choice, could have made a better choice. You remember every time you heard the name Jesus and every time you rejected it. You'll remember how your choices also influenced your family. Mom and dad, 
Your choices will influence what your kids do. There's a saying that says, what adults do in moderation, children do in excess. Excuse me while I put my soapbox. If you drink in moderation, your children will probably drink in excess. Because you're telling them it's okay that I'm doing it. I'm doing it in moderation. I'm good. And I can tell you that because that's me. My parents had an occasional drink. I drank excessively because I thought it was okay. What you do, what you allow, influences your family. Luke 16, 27, the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, send them to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want to warn them about this place of torment so they won't have to come here. You'll know in hell that your choices may have allowed your children to make the same choice you did. And you're going to remember that maybe I influenced my kid not to follow Christ. Maybe because of you, your choices, that they don't follow God. Revelation 20, who goes to hell? Verse 11 says, I saw a great white throne and I saw the one who was sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence and they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the things written in the books, according to what they had done. The sea gave up their dead in it and death and the grave gave up the dead in them. They were all judged according to their deeds and death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 20, or chapter 21, verse 27. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. No one who practices shameful idolatry and, and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. How many have ever seen the, the play Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames? It was out a while ago. We had it a number of times at our church. I think you guys have had it here once or twice, right? You guys ever have that here, Heaven's Gates? First of semi okay. The premise of the, of the play, did I share this last week? I don't think so. The premise of the play was you have um, a great staircase leading up to an angel with a big book. And you have little vignettes, little stories of people who, you know, were either driving in the same car together or whatever, and they both happened to die at the same time. And the lights go out, and then they, you know, the lights come back on, you see this great staircase up to the angel, and it's real bright light, and they both kind of wake up, and they're dead. And they look up to the angel, and they say, hey, angel, is my name in the book? And the first one is usually a pair, one person who's a believer, one's not. And... The angel looks at the book and says, yes, your name is in, and trumpets go off, lights go off, and they walk up the stairs. Then the other guy says, well, awesome, man, is my name in the book? And the angel looks at the book, and the angel says, no, your name's not in the book. Lights go dark. Devil comes out and drags this person away. Good emotional play. We've done it a couple of times. Theologically incorrect. Because there are two judgments. Christians are at one, Unbelievers are at the other, and never the two shall mix. And so when the Bible talks about the great white throne judgment, that is for everyone who is an unbeliever, who doesn't believe in Christ, doesn't trust in Christ. We already have our judgment, and our judgment is based on what we do. We're all going to get in, but God's going to say, okay, let's, let's look at what you did for me while you were here. And the Bible says you either be rewarded, or you'll get in, but kind of, you know, with your tail between your legs kind of thing. And so now you come to the great white throne judgment and basically God's saying here, okay, you said you want to be judged by your works, that you're a good person. Let's do it your way. And so God brings out the the things and he says, okay, if you were perfect in your life, your name will be in this book. Let's see. And when you're, the very first sin we commit, your name's gone from the book. Actually never never entered into the book and so everyone who is at this judgment everyone is judged how they want to be judged they want to be judged on what they do 
I'm a good person. I didn't steal anything. I never killed anybody. I'm going to make it in. God says, well, let me, let me show you what sin really is. And which means sin is anything against God. We did a study on that a while ago. So if we have one sin in our life, one, we're gone. And so our name is not found in the book. How do you get your name into the book? John 3.3 3 says, I assure you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.15, so that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. Believes in me. Not just believes that I existed. Believes in me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Titus 3, 4, it says, He saved us not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. I heard, a, I saw, I don't know, it was a picture on Facebook or something that said, thinking that you have to clean your life up before coming to Christ is the same thing as not going to the ER, waiting for the bleeding to stop. Because I want to go in looking good. I'll have this, I'll just clean it up, I'll bandage myself, and then I'll go to the emergency room. That's not the way it works. You come to God filthy, dirty, full of sin, God fixes you up, God cleans you up. Romans 10, verse 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Jesus' last words were to preach or share the gospel. Our mission on this planet is single fold. One mission. Point others to Jesus. If last words are important in someone's life, then we need to be about our Father's business. If I were to ask you what the vision statement of this church is, anybody tell me what that is? It's okay because I forgot it myself. However, it's on the back of every bulletin. And basically it means, or what a vision statement is, is why are we here? What is our goal as a church to be here? And I'll just read it because I can't quote it verbatim. It says, our vision is to provide the Dover area with a church that can present Christ in a contemporary, creative, and caring way in order to produce committed followers whose lives, whose lives have been made new to a personal relationship with the living God. The reason we exist is to be a life raft to the drowning people in our neighborhood. We're to, we have what they need. They are dying, and we have food. We have shelter. We have life. I heard D. James Kennedy give an example once. I may have used it before. If your neighbor's house is on fire, middle of the night, do you go up on the door and, oh, they're not home. I don't want to wake them up. I don't want to disturb them. Or do you bang on the door until somebody listens to get out of the house? That's the urgency. The reason I talked about hell is because that's the urgency we should have. We're not going to be there. We're believers. We're not going to be there. But there's a lot of people that we know that are. And if we have that knowledge and we have the information that they need and we don't tell them, our bad. Now, Ezekiel says, if you have the information and you don't tell them, it's on you. However, if you tell them, And they reject it. Well, that's on them. I mentioned before that, you know, parents have a lot of influence on the way their kids choose. That does not make us, let me rephrase that. Everyone has the choice to make. And we can never claim, well, my parent was a jerk, and because of that, I'm here. It doesn't work. Everyone has to make the choice. Your parents could be the worst parents to walk the face of the earth, And you have all kinds of reasons to be a jerk. But you still have to make the choice. You cannot use that as an excuse. Your parents can be the best person in the world, do everything right, and you still choose to do wrong. 
Guess whose fault that is? It's on you. You have the ability to share the gospel with people. They still have the ability to reject what you say. And they can keep rejecting it and keep rejecting it. And it's on them. But our job is to make sure that they least, at least have the information to make the choice. And then once they have the information, they can choose. This year our church is making a conscious effort to do more to reach out. You know, you talk about these things and it kind of puts into perspective other things, correct? When you think about eternity, you think about what hell is like and who's, who that you know is going to go there, it kind of dims the other problems we may have in our life. How many find that to be true? If I know someone is going to hell and they're dying, it kind of makes my, uh, my coffee was cold today, kind of feel stupid. Or any other thing that we may be complaining or griping about, we need to put that aside and say, this is the mission. It doesn't matter what's happening to me. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life because in, when push comes to shove, end of the day, it's not going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is were you faithful in sharing the word. I, I pray this, this phrase all the time. We need, it needs to matter that we're here. Does it matter that you work where you work? Does it matter that this church is here? Does it matter to our neighbors that we're here? I heard someone say yesterday, if your church closed its doors, would anybody notice? Would the township, anybody around here notice that we closed? Does it matter that we exist? Does it matter that I'm a Christian in a non-Christian workplace? Does anybody know? Because in eternity, nothing else matters. Music doesn't matter. Dress won't matter. Pews or chairs won't matter. Too loud, too soft, hot, cold. Nothing's going to matter in eternity but that. Does it matter that we're here as a church? As a body of believers, does it matter to Dover that we are here? If the rapture happens and, the, and we're gone, does anyone around here going to miss us for one? Are they going to remember what we did while we were here? Does it matter that we're here? Would you stand as we close this morning? Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. You know, the new year starts and you try to think about positive things. You hope the, the preaching is great and encouraging. And Sorry. But reality is we have a job to do as a, as a group of believers. And we have the ability to change not in ourselves, we have the information that allows people to change. We have what they need. It needs to matter that we're here. It needs to matter to somebody that we're here. Because if we're gone and the rapture happens, will the people around us realize that we were here? And will they miss us if we're gone? And will they remember the choices that they could have made while they were here? Or a better question would be, how many people, when the rapture happens, how many people go with us because we're here? Are people going to make it to heaven because Dover Assembly exists? Are people going to be in heaven because you exist? are a Christian because you took the time with them. Doesn't matter that we're here. Doesn't matter that you are where you are. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never really committed your life to Christ. Now, I see a lot of familiar faces, but you never want to go by that. You never want to assume that people have made that choice for themselves. 
So I'm going to ask you this morning. Do you know Christ? Have you asked Christ into your life to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness, to make you a believer and to make you make your name in the Lamb's book of life? If you have not and you want to, I want you to raise your hand right now. All right, I'm going to assume that we are all committed followers. And as such, I pray, Father, that you would fill each one of us with that burden and that desire. That, God, we would do whatever, it needs to be, whatever needs to be done in order to change or offer people Christ that can change their life, that can make things different for them. I pray that you'd fill us with the Holy Spirit, give us that ability, give us that holy unction. I pray that you would set up divine appointments for us. I pray, God, that it matters that we work in a certain office. I pray that it matters that Dover Assembly is here. I pray that it matters that we go to school somewhere or we work somewhere or we bank or we shop. Does it matter that we go to these places? It needs to matter. And I pray that, God, you would provide us with those opportunities, that you would take any fear or trepidation away from us and allow us to have that holy boldness Because if they were on fire, their house was on fire, we would have no hesitation about knocking the door down to get them out. Father, we need to have that same urgency when talking to people about Christ. We thank you that someone took time with us and maybe put up with our grief and our ridicule. But God, they kept at it. They didn't beat us over the head. They didn't drag us into a church. But God, they were faithful in living their life before us, continuing to use the conversation, sprinkle their conversation with salt, the Bible says, that they kept interjecting what Jesus has done for them into our life. And Father, for that, we're eternally grateful. I pray you'd bless each person as we leave today, Lord. Allow us to be that salt container to the people we know, people we come in contact with, and allow lives to be changed because we're simply being faithful to you. Keep us safe, Lord. Bring us back next Wednesday and then next Sunday to again worship you in spirit and in truth. And we commit ourselves to that in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Have a great week. Let me know of divine opportunities that God puts in your path.